All right. So yesterday we learned about these things called rational functions. So as a reminder, A rational function is a function. A rational function is a function. Shocking, you don't say. A rational function is a function that is a quotient or ratio of two polynomials. Now our last chapter was all about polynomials, right? So we're gonna be using a lot of the same things that we learned last time, um, uh, or that we learned in the last chapter here as well, because since a rational function is made up of polynomials, it's not that surprising that it cares an awful lot about polynomial rules. All right. So, they have the form f of x equals q of x, oh, sorry, p of x over q of x, p of x over q of x. where P and Q are polynomials. Okay. Now, we saw this yesterday. We learned about rational functions. Now, yesterday, what we were doing is we were introducing ourselves to the, to the idea of these things called horizontal and vertical asymptotes by looking at the most basic um, uh, rational function, also called the reciprocal function. So if we just run to Desmos for just a moment, just to refresh our memory here. Okay. So the reciprocal function looked something like this. Let's see, hold it, am I? Yeah, okay. Whoa. The reciprocal function looked something like f of x equals 1 over x. And we see that it has these big, these places where it either shoots up to infinity or flattens out. We could move them around by adding or subtracting numbers to the x to move it left or right or we could move it up or down by adding or subtracting a number. And we saw that this could move the asymptotes around. Now today we're gonna to try to get a better understanding of where these asymptotes come from and therefore how we can find our asymptotes. Now we're not, I don't think we're gonna have quite enough time to, re, to be able to graph or make sketch graphs of any uh, rational function, but we should be able to, by the time we're done, find the asymptotes of any rational function. And then tomorrow we'll learn how we can leverage that to, to a graph, okay. So, okay, will anyone yell at me if I take this away?
Okay, no yelling. So, first, where do these asymptotes come from? Well, let's consider, okay, well, let's, let's actually go back to Desmos to talk about this. So, why is there a vertical asymptote? In this case, why is there a vertical asymptote at one? Well, if you think about it for a moment, what is happening is as our x value gets closer and closer to 1, say from the right, 1.3, 1.2, 1.1, our y value, our output value, is increasing. Now, why is that? Well, what's happening is that our denominator is getting closer and closer to zero. Now, remember that when you take a number and divide it by smaller numbers, the overall value of the quotient will increase. So like five divided by, five divided by one is five, but five divided by 0 0.1, 0 0.1, that's 50. 5 divided by 0 0.001, that's 5,000. 5, so, as the denominator gets closer to zero, our overall output gets higher and higher. And we can see that here. As x gets closer to 1, our denominator gets closer and closer to zero, which means that our overall value goes higher and higher. So, I'll use, I'll use black. Given f of x equals p of x over q of x, what does that tell us about vertical asymptotes? Well, vertical asymptotes occur when the denominator would be zero. We're getting higher and higher and higher, closer and closer as we get closer and closer to that x value, but we never actually reach that x value because we're never allowed to divide by zero itself. So, given uh, f of x equals p of x over q of x, f as a vertical asymptote when the denominator q of x equals zero. We're never allowed to actually plug that number into this function because we're never allowed to divide by zero, but uh, our asymptote will be at that x value. This vertical asymptote, or actually, it doesn't necessarily need, a function can have more than one vertical asymptote, so it really should say has vertical asymptotes when q of x equals zero, and they are vertical lines, so they have the equation x equals, you know, a number, x equals n. where n is a zero of q. 
Now, what about horizontal asymptotes? How do those work? Well, once again, running back to Desmos, try to understand how this works. Our horizontal asymptote as I have larger and larger x values, our horizontal asymptote gets closer and closer to just, in this case, three. It's never exactly three. It never goes all the way down to three. But as I plug in big numbers, in this case, 67, but I can go as far to the right as I want, it will eventually give us, or it it will never give us three, but it gets closer and closer and closer to three. So our horizontal asymptote is determined by the results of plugging in very large numbers in, in for x. So if I plug in, say, a thousand, I would have one over a thousand. A thousand plus three would give me 3.001. This is different from something like x squared, where, <laughs> where if I just plug in a large number into x squared, I'll get a really large output. This looking at what our, an equation does far to the right is called the end behavior of the function. Let's see. Someone has their microphone on? not a big deal, but there we go. It, it, it can be a little bit distracting for my poor attention deficit mind. So horizontal asymptotes, or yeah, horizontal asymptotes are determined by the end behavior of a function. And we have talked about end behavior before, but the end behavior is what the function or what the function does. And we plug in very large positive and negative values. Does it blow up? or approach some, some number. So if our end behavior of our function just approaches some number, then we'll have a horizontal asymptote of that value. Oops, I got confused. Here we go. If the function's end behavior approaches some finite value, 
let's say n as we input large numbers. And this is, and to be clear, when I say large numbers, they, they can be both positive or negative. We can be plugging in a very large positive number would be looking at our function does way to the right. Plugging in a large negative number like negative 2 million would be looking at our function at what it's doing as we go to the left. So anyway, if it approaches some, some finite value n as we, as we input large numbers, will be a horizontal asymptote of y equals n. OK. Take a moment, make sure you have all this down. Then we'll put this in action. Okay. Will anyone yell at me if I take stuff if I take this away? No yelling. Okay. Now let's go ahead and put this into action. Okay. Let's find the asymptotes of f of x equals, oh, let's say, Sorry, got yawny there. Anyway, let's find the find the horizontal and or find the asymptotes of f of x equals four x over x minus three. Well, what did we learn last time? Well, f the first thing we learned is about the vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes will be when the denominator is zero. So when will this denominator be zero? What can I plug in that would make the bottom zero?
Anybody? What can I plug in that would make the bottom zero? Well, it's pretty straightforward. This one, we can just look at it and see. If I plug in 3, the bottom will be 3 minus 3 is 0. So x equals 3 would make the denominator zero. So there is a vertical asymptote. of x equals 3. Note that since this is written x equals 3, that is going to be a vertical line. Writing x equals n will give you a vertical line at n. So that's easy enough. Now, what about the horizontal asymptote? Well, we said that the horizontal asymptote is determined by end behavior. That, if we approach some finite value as we plug in large numbers, there will be a horizontal asymptote at that value. So let's just plug some large numbers into this function. to find the horizontal asymptote. We can plug in large numbers. And see what value it is approaching. Okay, so go ahead and uh, give me some large numbers, any large numbers, doesn't really matter which ones. Dead silence falls across the room. OK, 56. Sure, why not? Now, you can plug in really as big as you want. You could plug in 100, 1,000, 10,000, 10 trillion. But let's try plugging in 56. Well, on top, that would be 4, let's see, 4 times 56. And on bottom, that would be 56 minus 3. Now, when I plugged in 56, I got 4.22. Now let's try a bigger number. Let's say 200. That would be 4 times 200 divided by 200 minus 3. That's giving me 4.06. You probably see where this is going. Now let's plug in an even larger number, like, say, 1,000. Four. 
four times a thousand divided by a thousand minus three. That gives me 4.01. So as I plug in larger and larger numbers, What number is this getting closer to? As I plug in larger and larger numbers, what value is this getting closer to? it looks like it's getting closer and closer to four. Now, really, we should be looking at negatives as well. So let's also just try plugging in negative 56, negative 200, and negative 1,000. Let's see what we get. See if it's also approaching four. Let's see, four times negative 56 over negative 56 minus three, that gives me 3.79. Four times a negative 200 divided by negative 200 minus three, that's 3.94. When I plug in a thousand, four times a negative thousand divided by a negative thousand minus three, that's giving me 3.98. So as we can see, as we plug in bigger and bigger numbers in either direction, either to the right or to the left, either way, we're getting closer and closer to four. So the function approaches four. As we plug in bigger numbers. Therefore, ergo, it has a horizontal asymptote. of y equals 4. Horizontal asymptotes give you x equals number because that gives you a vertical line. Horizontal asymptotes give you y equals number because y equals number gives you a horizontal line. There we go. Now let's go ahead and check our work by graphing it with Desmos. Desmos. There we go. Uh -huh. Let's go from here. Okay. So we had a horizontal asymptote or a vertical asymptote of x equals 3. We have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 4. Now let's go ahead and graph our function and see if our asymptotes look good f of x equals 4x over x minus 3. Would you look at that? We found our asymptotes correctly. OK.
Will anyone yell at me if I take this away? Okay. Now, vertical asymptotes was fairly straightforward. You needed to see what numbers would can make the bottom be zero. Now, that isn't necessarily always trivial because, you know, if there there could be more than one zero, the bottom could be a quadratic or some bigger, uglier polynomial. But the bottom has a pretty straightforward procedure. Find the zeros of the denominator. But for the horizontal asymptote, we kind of had to plug in numbers and using a calculator and ugh. And, that, and that's just kind of a little bit time consuming. But fortunately, we can actually learn a bit of a shortcut for horizontal asymptotes. So, So I'm going to call this a shortcut, but it's that's a, almost not giving it enough credit. Because this really is the best way to find horizontal asymptotes. Okay. Uh, where's my rag? There it is. Okay. So you don't you don't necessarily need to write this down here, but so consider we have. Let's just say that we have a. Uh, Say we have f of x equals, let's say, x squared plus 3x plus 100. Now, which of these terms is the most important for determining the value of the function? Well, that 100 term, 100 is a pretty big number, yeah? So it sure seems like 100 is the most important term. But as I plug in larger and larger values for x, this 100 will start to matter less and less and less. Let's say I plug in 100 into this function, or let's say I plug in 10 into this function. That would give, or, yeah. Uh, okay, well, if I plug in a small number, like say five, then I would have 25 plus 75 plus 100 for a total of 200. Now, when I plug in a small number like 5, this term wasn't really all that important. This term was more important to give us a larger number. And this term was the most important of all because it was a pretty beefy constant. So f of 5 is 25 plus 75 plus 100 is 200. So for small numbers, for small numbers, the constant, in this case 100, or for small inputs, I should say, 
for small inputs, the constant is the most important term. What about for larger numbers? Let's say I plug in 100. That would be 100 squared. What is 100 squared? Uh, 100 100s, that's 10,000, I think. Yeah, 10,000. Ten thousand plus three hundred plus one hundred. Now, when I plugged in this larger number, the constant doesn't isn't as important because now all the other stuff is a lot bigger. This gives us ten thousand four hundred. But by far the most important is that x squared term. For large inputs, the leading term, in this case x squared, is the most important. So what am I getting at here? So as I plug in larger and larger values, the non-leading terms become less and less important. If I was to plug in f equals 10 billion, well, this would be 10, the leading term would be 10 billion squared, which would be huge. Whereas this would just be 30 billion, and this would still just be 100. So for very large inputs, and 10 billion is you know very large, but we don't need to go necessarily even nearly that big for this to come into play. Plug in a thousand, and these other terms can be are just ignorable. So for very large inputs, oops. non-leading terms are negligible. Like if I plug in a thousand into this, that would be a, thou a thousand s squared plus three thousand plus a hundred. That gives me a million, which is, a, or a million three thousand which is still about a million. They're very, very, they're very, pretty similar numbers. Okay. So why is this important? Well, this means that when finding our horizontal asymptotes, we can basically ignore all of the non-leading terms. So will anyone yell at me if I take this little board away? So here's our shortcut for finding horizontal asymptotes. Ignore the non-leading terms of P and Q, that is the numerator and the denominator. 
just look at the leading terms. Now, if we entirely ignore the leading terms, then that leaves us with three possible scenarios. Case one. If the degree Just try to squeeze this in. If the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator there is no asymptote. That would be something like f of x equals x cubed plus 1 over x squared minus 3, minus 3x, let's say. So if we follow this shortcut, then we can just ignore these guys. They don't contribute to the horizontal asymptote. They are important for the vertical asymptotes, but they're neg neg negligible bleh, for the horizontal asymptote. Now, x to the third has a higher degree than x squared, which means that as I plug in larger numbers, it's just going to get something bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So this guy has no asymptote. or no horizontal asymptote. It'll still have a vertical asymptote. But it will not have a vertical asymptote. Or sorry, it will not have a horizontal asymptote. OK, cool. So that's if their degree, if the top has a greater degree than the bottom. What if the bottom has a greater degree than the top? Just to save space, instead of saying numerator, denominator, I'm going to say top and bottom. If the degree of the top is less the degree of the bottom. The horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. This would be like Let's say f of x equals, let's say we have x squared plus x all over x to the third power plus x squared minus 1. 
Now remember, we can just ignore everything except the leading terms. X cubed has a greater degree. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. OK. Now, finally, that leaves us one last case, which I'm going to need to go to a different board for. So will anyone yell at me if I erase what's here or move it aside? OK, no one's yelling. So our last case. If the degree of the top and bottom match, then the horizontal asymptote will be whatever they simplify to after we ignore all of the, uh, after we ignore all of the, um, uh, non-leading terms. We would say that's the, going to be the quotient of the leading coefficients. So let's say, for example, we have f of x equals, I don't know, 6x squared plus x all over let's say 4x squared minus 1. Well remember that the shortcut tells us that when finding the horizontal asymptote we can just ignore everything that isn't the leading term. Now, what this means is that the x is that as I plug in very large numbers, these x squareds will actually cancel out, leaving us with just 6 over 4, which simplifies to 3 halves. So this function has the horizontal asymptote. y equals 3 over 2. All right, and with that, we're out of time. I was hoping to do an example of uh, using all this stuff to find some, to, you know, doing some examples. But, uh, un but we are out of time. So we'll have to look at examples and how to actually leverage this to graphing tomorrow, which is about what I expected. Anyway, so today we learned uh, we learned what horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes represent. Ho vertical asymptotes can be found when the denominator would equal zero. Horizontal asymptotes are the values you approach as you plug in increasingly large numbers into the function. Anyway, and that is about that. 
I will see you guys tomorrow. And uh, have a great day. There is a check for understanding uploaded already. <laughs>